In this lesson, we will fawn over the beautiful simplicity that is the periodic table. I'll describe why the periodic table is organized the way that it is and how this organization is useful to chemists. Then I'll talk about a few ways to classify the elements on the periodic table. Long before we knew all the elements, Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev had the idea to arrange the elements in order of increasing mass. He noticed that certain patterns emerge when you do. For example, non-reactive gases were always followed by soft reactive metals. But his true moment of brilliance came when he stacked the elements with similar properties in columns, creating the first periodic table. One thing to note about a good scientific breakthrough is that it's predictive. Mendeleev predicted the physical and chemical properties of elements which hadn't yet been discovered. When they were discovered and had the properties he predicted, the periodic table gained widespread acceptance. The big takeaway here is that the periodic table is arranged in order of increasing atomic number. Furthermore, all the elements in a column share similar chemical properties. Now, you'll notice some gaps in the table, such as between elements four and five, but I promise that those gaps will be explained in chapter six, along with many more properties of the table. And I'd, I'd like to pause here just to marvel at this table. Uh, it's, I would consider it not only a work of science, but also a work of art. The periodic table is unquestionably the central diagram of chemistry. And since chemistry is the central field of science, that makes the periodic table the central diagram of the sciences. We will be returning to the periodic table again and again and again this term. You will benefit immensely from having a copy within reach at all times. You can find the periodic table on the inside cover of any chemistry textbook, and you will be provided a copy of the table on every exam in this class. And if you ask me nicely, I will happily print you out a copy of the periodic table to keep forever. Each entry in the periodic table corresponds to a unique element and contains at least three pieces of information. The element symbol, the element's atomic number, and the element's atomic mass. The element symbol comes from its name. However, sometimes this name was not the English name. In particular, watch out for the eight common elements in the orange table with non-intuitive symbols. Recall from the previous lessons that the element's atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus, and the element's atomic mass is the average mass of all isotopes of that element. We say the periodic table is periodic, because its rows and columns follow a similar pattern. The table's columns are known as groups or families, and the table's rows are called periods. My advice is to pay more attention to the columns than the rows. Families of elements share similar chemical properties, perhaps in the same way that families of humans do. Another example of a periodic table is a calendar. We put all the Mondays in the same column because they all share a similar property. It's the start of the work week and we get to learn chemistry together. A calendar has a period of seven days because that is how often it repeats. Now, there are many, many ways to classify elements on the periodic table. We'll only look at two of those ways today. The broadest way is to divide them into the main group elements and the transition metals. The main group elements are situated in the first two and last six columns of the table, numbered 1a to 8a. The chemistry of these elements will be the focus of this class, especially the first 20 elements or so. The properties of these elements are easy to predict because they come from an element's valence electrons, which we'll talk about a lot later. The transition metals make up the inside of the periodic table and their properties are all over the place. Don't worry too much about these elements. Note that there are two ways to number the columns of the table. I will be primarily using the numbers in red since they also correspond to how many valence electrons elements in that column have. Another way to divide the table up is into metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Metals live on the left side of the table. In general, metals easily lose electrons, which greatly affects their chemistry. Their loosely held electrons also make them good conductors of electricity. 
Nonmetals live on the right side of the table. In general, nonmetals hold tightly to their electrons and want to gain more. We'll see that this will cause them to share electrons and form compounds called molecules. Metalloids are sandwiched between the metals and nonmetals. Metalloids will both gain or lose electrons depending on who they're paired with. Their properties are in between those of metals and nonmetals. Before we end, I want to re-emphasize the importance of groups on the periodic table. Each group of the table has similar chemical reactivity because it has the same number of valence electrons. This is one of the most important concepts of the class. A few groups are common enough that we've given them special names. I recommend writing these group names on your periodic table. Group 1A are the alkali metals. These ones are fun because they explode when they touch water. Group 2A are the alkaline earth metals. These ones are also fun because they also explode when they touch water. Group 6A are the chalcogens. Elements in this group share properties of the flagship chalcogen, oxygen. Group 7A is a personal favorite of mine, the halogens. The halogens are some of the most reactive and corrosive elements on the table that will eat through nearly anything. In high concentrations, they will kill you dead, yet humans have also found great use in the elements of this group. Lastly, group 8A are the noble gases. These elements are extremely unreactive, like super boring, but also a little bit impressive. When I feel my temper rising, I try to channel my inner noble gas.